Today's webinar is entitled Tracing Our Ancestry Using Genetics to Investigate Genealogy. Our presenter today is RIT alumnus Dr. Rick Kittles. Dr. Kittles is a professor and founding director of the Division of Health Equities within the Department of Popular Sciences at the City of Hope. He is also the Associate Director of Health Equities of the City of Hope Comprehensive Cancer Center. Dr. Kittles is well known for his research of prostate cancer and health disparities among African Americans. Dr. Kittles' research has focused on understanding the complex issues surrounding race, genetics, ancestry, and health disparities. Dr. Kittles received a PhD in Biological Sciences from George Washington University in 1998. His first faculty appointment was at Howard University, where he helped establish the, Na the National Human Genome Center. Over the last 20 years, Dr. Kittles has been at the forefront of development of ancestry informative genetic making and how genetic ancestry can be qualified and utilized in genomic studies on disease risk and outcomes. His work has shown the impact of genetic variation across populations in, pharma in pharmacogenomics, biomakers discovery, and disease gene mapping. Although a major focus of Dr. Kittle's work over the past year has been measure, measuring and utilizing West African admixture in studies of genetic disease among African Americans, presently he is expanding his research focus to further include Latino and Native American populations to further enhance the robustness of the experimental design of his research studies. In 2010, Dr. Kittles was named in Ebony Magazine's The Ebony Power 100. Ebony selected the nation's top 100 African American power players in sports, academia, religion, business, environment, science and technology, entertainment, arts and letters, fashion, politics, media, activism and health. In March of 2012, Dr. Kittles presented the keynote address to the United Nations General Assembly at the International Day of Remembrance of Victims of Slavery in the Transatlantic Slave Trade. Recently, Dr. Kittles was named by the Huffington Post as one of the 50 iconic black trailblazers who represents every state in America. Dr. Kittles has published over 160 research articles on prostate cancer genetics, race and genetics, and health disparities. We are thrilled to have you with us, Dr. Kittles. Let's get started. All right, thank you, Erin. And I wanna welcome everybody today to the uh, webinar. Today, I'm gonna to talk about uh, using genetics to understand your family history and genealogy. Uh, this is uh, work that I've been uh, involved in for a while, and so, uh, it's uh, quite exciting. I'm going to go over some of the history and then also how we uh, uh, utilize genetics to uh, say something about ancestry. So many of you know that uh, uh, family uh, history and tracing your family roots has been a hobby for many people across the world. Um, Time magazine uh, back in uh, the, the 90s actually had a cover story on how to search for your roots. This is at a time when there were companies that were emerging that were developing databases uh, with family history records. And these are the traditional genealogy records, birth records, death records, um, marriage uh, licenses and certificates. So these databases emerged um, uh, and a lot of it uh, uh, was led by the Mormons in Utah uh, and um, uh, they set up uh, a big database called Ancestry.com, as, as a matter of fact, and, and that was really driving a lot of the obsession that uh, Americans have. But, you know, there's groups in the uh, United States that have a unique history, such as African Americans, and uh, there was a recent web-based poll that revealed that it, at least 80% of African Americans believe it would be important to scientifically determine African ancestry through DNA testing, and it's not surprising given the uh, unique history of African Americans. And when we talk about this unique history, it is one in which there was no sort of uh, 
um, uh, voluntary migration, but in fact it was a forced migration and, and kidnapping of enslaved West and Central Africans. And uh, during this, this period of the transatlantic slave trade, there were generations of, uh, of individuals who were lost in terms of their uh, knowledge of their family history and heritage and, and the like. And, and it created a situation where individuals had no clear idea in terms of their family history. And um, uh, if you think about the psychological ramifications behind that, it could have an enormous impact in terms of how one shapes their identity. In comes genetics. Uh, in the uh, late 90s, there was this race to map the human genome. That's the genetic material that is in every cell of our body except for the uh, red blood cell. Uh, and it, it makes us who we are. And, and so we uh, started this project in the United States called the Human Genome Project, where scientists, uh, not just here but all over the world, were involved in mapping the genome to try to understand how many genes are there, what, does, what do those genes do, and how do they make us who we are, and also, to some extent, how they impact our risk for disease. But when we started looking across populations at different uh, genetic variations, uh, we noticed that uh, that variation could say something about the history of those, of those populations. So one of the, the fruits of the labor of the Genome Project was that we found that there's about 20,000 genes in the human genome, and we have these chemical bases called nucleotides. These, uh, for short, we call them A, C, T, and G. These nucleotides and the, and the sequence of them code for these 20,000 genes, and they're on 23 pairs of chromosomes. These genes code for things like skin color and eye color and hair color, hair texture, body height, body weight and the like. Um, and then also, to some extent, how susceptible or predisposed we are to disease. Uh, this was uh, an enormous undertaking, and it, and it was um, um, millions and millions of dollars and, 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 and labor and expense, but also it provided uh, useful insight in terms of our understanding of where humans are placed in the um, uh, evolution of of organisms in the, in the world. And so uh, after sequencing the, the human genome, we sequence uh, other genomes like the dog and, and cat and, and rice and apple and the mouse and the rat. All of these different organisms we, we, and animals, we found that uh, uh, the number of genes really didn't vary much. In fact, the dog has about 19,000 genes, which uh, comparably isn't that much different than humans. And so it was an enlightening experience for some because many believe that we were a higher order being and, and we had to have more genes than some of these uh, uh, animals, other animals. And so uh, it, was a, it was an interesting uh, acknowledgement. So the, uh, uh, these genes are on 23 pairs of chromosomes and, and it's Fascinating when you look at the size of some of these chromosomes, some of them are what we call gene rich, others are gene poor, given the size. And uh, today I'm gonna to talk about, um, to some extent, the, the sex chromosome, in particular the Y chromosome, which really is a tiny glob of DNA compared to some of these other cr chromosomes. Uh, but it's important because that is the chromosome that defines uh, maleness and man, uh, the, uh, the maleness traits, and so the the sex determinant on the Y chromosome is important, and we can actually uh, explore the inheritance of that because it's inherited what we call clonally, meaning that there's a direct copy every generation through men. So Y chromosomes are passed on through men. You get, if you're a male, you got it from your father, his, him from his father, and, and back uh, 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 to previous generations. So when we look at these DNA variants, if we were to explore these 3 billion nucleotides, these A, C, Ts, and Gs that I mentioned earlier, we find that there's uh, some, some differences. If we compare any two people on this planet, even if they're within a family, within a household, there'll be variation. We call those variations polymorphisms. Poly means many, morph means different forms, different forms of, or many forms of the sequence of the DNA. In fact, you see in this, uh, this slide, you'll see that at that second to last position as a C, and maybe 94% of the population 
uh, inherit a C there, and only 6% instead of a C, they may have a T. That is what we call a SNP, a single nucleotide polymorphism. This is important because when we catalog all of these variants, these polymorphisms, these SNPs, we find that there are millions of them across the genome. Where they are is of particular interest because some of them are within genes and they have major consequences in terms of the function of that gene, whether it's for skin color or for hair texture or even susceptibility for something like breast cancer. So as a geneticist, we've been cataloging these variants across genes in large um, population studies to try to understand the impact of these variants on overall health and ancestry. We look at variation, genetic variation across human populations, we find that the African continent has the most genetic variation. And that's not surprising given what we know about the history of humans and the, on the planet. Humanity started in Africa about 200, 150, 200,000 years ago. And because of that, there has been a lot more accumulation of genetic variation on the African continent. We look at Europeans and Asians, they carry with them a subset of that variation. About 80,000 years ago, populations started moving out of Eastern Africa into the Middle East, Asia, and um, uh, Europe. And when they left, they carried with them a subset of that variation that's rooted in Africa, which is why in this Venn diagram, you see this overlap, the large overlap. There's a lot of variation that's consistent or what we call common across all populations. But then there's variation that's exclusive or unique. For instance, uh, uh, if we look at uh, the African population, almost half of the genetic variation that we find uh, is exclusive just to Africa. So it's not found in Europe or Asia, while only 10% of the variation in Europe and Asia is exclusive to Europe and Asia. This is important because it says something about, like I said before, human evolution and the migration of human populations. And so given the fact that African populations have been here longer, they've been larger in size, we find a lot more variation there. So if you're a scientist and you're really trying to understand genetic variation, you really should go where the root of that variation is to get a more comprehensive assessment of that. And that's something that has been happening over the last 15, uh, 20 years. When we look at Africa as a continent, it is rich in not just biological or genetic diversity, but also cultural diversity. This map shows different dialogue, uh, di di dialogue, dialects or languages spoken across different populations or different communities. And you'll notice just within the area around Nigeria and Cameroon, for those of you who are, are ge geography buffs, you can tell that there are thousands of different dialects spoken just in that area. This is an area that's rich in cultural diversity, linguistic diversity, and also biological and geographic um, uh, ecological diversity too. And a lot of that is what creates um, variation across populations is when you have these geographic boundaries such as desert or, 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 or rainforest, tropical rainforest or savanna grasslands, and populations move according to their resources. And so the, uh, it's not surprising that we see this much genetic variation in African populations. We can use genetics also to show the history, the migration of humans. And so as I mentioned, about 100,000, 80,000 into the Middle East, going into Europe about 40,000 years, human populations going into Asia about 50,000, across the Bering Straits into the New World about 20,000 years ago, 15 to 20,000 years ago. And What's fascinating is when we look at the genetic variation of the New World, be it North and South America and, the, and Latin America, we see a subset of that variation that's rooted in Asia. So Native Americans, those, uh, the uh, original um, uh, natives to uh, the New World, carry with them a subset of that variation that is within Asia. Asia carries a subset of the variation that we see in the Middle East. And that represents a subset of the variation we see in Eastern and Central Africa. And so we, it's not surprising, you can, you can actually trace, it's, it's like a hierarchy, not a hierarchy, but it's like a, 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 um, a ladder of, of movement and variation out of Africa into um, a new territory. And we call those, those founder effects and those bottlenecks um, important for what we see in terms of genetic variation. But what we find, what I find interesting is when we 
we try to reconcile what we see genetically with history. And uh, this is where things get really, really interesting. In the United States, we know that we have this, this melting pot, this convergence of diverse ancestries and cultures. We have this sampling of global diversity here in the, in the Americas. We have indigenous uh, Americans, we have Europeans, and we have West and Central Africans that were, that were brought here, and then also East Asians, right? And so we have this, this continuum of variation uh, established by the mixing of these populations, and we call this a melting pot. It is. However, socially, politically, the history of this country is one that's based on segregation and slavery, and so we, we have this, this polarized dichotomy in terms of race, but it's really social political. In terms of genetic variation and biological variation, it isn't consistent with the um, social political history. We know that there's been anti-miscegenation laws, or the anti-mixing laws, and this one drop rule, which was a legally socially classified or legislated rule to define people here in the U.S. who had African descent. So they said if you had one drop of, of African ancestry, you are considered uh, black in America. And so that was legislated. That had nothing to do with any sort of biological uh, importance, but what it was was it was set up so that um, um, European populations could maintain power, in particular in the South, and during the period of, the, uh, of slavery in the South. And so these um, socially defined, uh, behavioral sort of defined um, movements created a lot of interesting dynamics as it relates to genetic variation in the new world. Um, I, I like to use the example of Thomas Jefferson, who um, we know um, uh, had uh, children with some of his enslaved uh, African women. And uh, these individuals um, uh, were considered um, African American, or not African American at the time, but you know we call them African American now, but they were not considered um, uh, European. And so this, this, this effect, which I, which I, you know, generally call the Jefferson effect, is one in which, you know, individuals with power who had children, the children were not able to uh, translate that, that, uh, that wealth that they had because they, one of their parents were of African descent. So, uh, when we look at the genetic features of African, the African American population, we see that there is high genetic variation uh, due to the antiquity of African ancestry, that old gene pool that I mentioned. Um, when we go back to the Venn diagram, that's, that's a lot of variation that is due to the um, ancestry uh, or the antiquity of the African population. But then there's also g genetic diversity that's generated due to gene flow or admixture with non-Africans in the African-American population. And that, a lot of that has mainly been through white males historically um, during the period of slavery. And so we see this uh, signature in the gene pool of African-Americans. In fact, if we were to look at Y chromosomes, which as I mentioned before, are inherited through men, if we were to uh, um, study, let's say for instance, 10 African-American men about three to four of them would have a European Y chromosome. And that is a direct sort of evidence and signature of the uh, gene flow from European populations into the African American population. So 30%, 35% on average uh, of black men have European Y chromosomes. And so that's part of this, as I mentioned, this unique history that we see here um, among the African Americans compared to other groups in, the, in, the, in, in North America. And it's not unique to just North America, but I mean in terms of uh, the when you compare across North American populations, African Americans have this unique this unique history. We also know that the pattern of genetic variation differs geographically across the United States. So what we see, for instance, in let's say Louisiana, in terms of African American communities, is vastly different than what we see genetically in let's say Seattle or the Gullah Sea Islands off the coast of South Carolina. Local histories and local experiences matter. They really help establish what we see in terms of family history and genealogy and genetics of those areas. Each community had their own sort of unique history, and I'll talk some about that in a second. So when we talk about the antiquity, we're talking about uh, and, and, and where that came from in terms of the African-American gene pool, we're talking about those areas that were 
where um, enslaved Western Central Africans were captured and brought to the New World, mainly northern Senegal to southern Angola. So throughout West Africa, that, that, that area that's it, it's in yellow there, that is where the bulk of the African um, uh, ancestors for, for African Americans came from, and about 5% from East Africa, Mozambique and Madagascar, but 95% came from Western Central Africa. This is very important because when we look at these areas culturally, when we look at them biologically, they are very uh, rich in terms of diversity. And so we see that rooted in the African American uh, gene pool. What's also fascinating is that they all didn't come to North America. Many came to the Caribbean, uh, Central America, and then also South America, with Brazil having the largest number of, in, of, uh, uh, of people of African descent outside of Africa. In fact, 80 million people of African descent are in Brazil, which is quite, quite, uh, quite high. When enslaved Africans were brought to, to North America, they were brought to three main areas that were controlled by three main European countries. And this is why I say local experiences matter. So if you're a genealogist and you're trying to understand family history, you really have to also understand the areas in which your families grew up and the areas, I mean, and, and, the, and, the, and the European countries that controlled that area during that time period. So, for instance, the British controlled the mid-Atlantic states, right? So we go from um, uh, uh, the area, uh, uh, as you see there in, in, in orange, those were under British control, and the, the Spanish, uh, Florida, and uh, the French Louisiana and the like. Remember, we purchased Louisiana from the French. Well, we didn't purchase it, but the United States did. But anyway, the, 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 what, what's fascinating is that each one of those three countries had a different sort of MO as, as, it, as it relates to, or behavior as it relates to people of African descent. In some cases, it was a very standoffish, controlling, sort of structured, uh, relationship, and in others, it was a more a, a more uh, social um, and um, um, uh, uh, a social sort of inter high, higher social interaction. And so, because of that, we see in the gene pool of many of these families from these particular areas uh, deep signatures. Let's say, for instance, in, in Louisiana, of French ancestry in the African American population. Now I can't I can't deny that at some level there was some Native American populations that contributed also into the gene pool of African Americans, but it was very small. In fact, it was in fact it was less than five percent, depending on where uh, geographically those families were. Um, we know though that um, in in, the, in Florida, for instance, the Seminoles and um, and the Cherokee and the East Coast. Uh, to some, to, in some communities, contributed a lot to the gene pool of those African American communities. So, uh, and we can see that in the genetics of those of those families. However, this is where we see this is where we find African Americans today. I mean, they're still pretty much where the bulk were were brought during the period of slavery, which is in what I call the Crescent Southeast, from uh, D.C. down into let's say Houston, uh, Texas. And uh, the Mississippi River, as you can see, highly um, dark in that area, representing a, a lot of African descent individuals. Um, and this is this is this depicts the 2000 census, but if we were to go to the most recent one, it would still be the same. And you'll notice that the Mississippi River was a major highway up to north, up north to areas in um, uh, uh, Missouri, Louisiana, uh, Michigan, all the way up. Uh, in, 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 in the uh, areas where that became urbanized, and so we had this great migration that occurred um, after the first war, where um, uh, many people of African descent went up north for better jobs and opportunities, but in fact ended up many of them in um, uh, uh, communities that were over overpopulated and um, resources not not um, uh, equal to um, other communities. You notice out west there really are not uh, there really there really is not a lot of African descent individuals. Um, if you, in California, you see uh, the area there; it's a little dark. That's Oakland, um, but for the bulk for the for the for the, the the bulk of the West, you don't see the concentration that you see in the Southeast. I'm not saying that African Americans aren't there. I'm just saying that the numbers are not with reflective of what we see. Where you see in certain communities, let's say in South Carolina and Mississippi, Alabama, where there's over 60. 70% uh, African descent uh, in, those, in those counties. 
So this is, this is important because if you want to study African Americans and try to understand their history and how it impacts on health in some areas, you really have to understand where they are and why uh, uh, they're there. So what I find fascinating is when we compare African Americans to the Hispanics, uh, we see this macro um, segregation at this macro level. We see, um, as I mentioned, African Americans in the Southeast, Hispanic populations in the Southwest. Uh, and that's mainly uh, from uh, Texas, New Mexico, Southern California. But you also see it in Florida, Southern Florida, and that's a different set of Hispanics, right? So these Hispanics that we see in the East Coast, whether um, New York, D.C., or Miami, they represent Latino, I mean, uh, they represent Cuban, uh, Dominican, um, uh, Puerto Rican uh, um, uh, heritage, which is quite vastly different in the sense, in terms of family history from, let's say, Mexican-Americans in Southwest uh, uh, the U.S. And, and this, is, this is also very fascinating because Hispanics uh, represent a major sort of what I call a conglomerate. They are grouped together because they speak Spanish. However, vastly different heritage and, and family histories and ancestries, uh, but they do uh, have this language connection. Um, and so when you group them all together, it creates a lot of heterogeneity, a lot of diversity that could impact um, uh, uh, what, you're, what you're trying to study. And uh, because recently, you know, I think it was the 2000 census actually where you could start, where you, where you had an opportunity to uh, say that you were mixed, um, we found that the bulk of folks who say they were mixed were out west. And um, uh, a lot of them in Oklahoma, which was a, a fascinating um, uh, story, which I'll, I'll share shortly. Uh, Oklahoma, uh, these folks who say that they were mixed aren't just African Americans who say that they're mixed with, let's say, Native American, but also whites who say that they're mixed with Native Americans. Historically, folks didn't necessarily admit that they had this family history with Native Americans, and it wasn't until recently where it became more fashionable and, and there was this um, utility in terms of defining or, uh, or, or, or or promoting your Native American ancestry. And I find that to be quite interesting because, uh, uh, you know, we go through these different periods and folks' identity changes. We, we sort of use, we, 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 we not necessarily create, but we form our identity based on family history and knowledge of our ancestry. But a lot of it is how we utilize it. What's the purpose in terms of sharing this, this ancestry with others or even how others define our ancestry? So I think all of that is quite, quite interesting. You'll notice that out west, in particular Southern California, you see, and also in northern, um, the, the Pacific uh, Northwest, uh, a lot of folks who say that they are of mixed ancestry. When we look at the genetics of those communities, which I'll show you in a second, there is a reason why they say that they're mixed, because they are. And, and the genetics shows that. And there is this understanding, too, you know, there are these, these social norms that emerge regionally across the United States depending on the history of those areas. Remember I said local experiences matter. So when you look at the, um, uh, uh, these populations out west, these communities out west, and their understanding of themselves and how they define themselves, it's very different than in the southeast. It's, you know, as I said, we have this relaxation of these social constraints. In the southeast, you're black. It doesn't matter who your father was, or your grandfather was, you're considered a black male or a black female. But out West, folks are actually saying that they're mixed, that they are, you know, and, and there's this acceptance there, and, there's, and you can see it uh, much more um, evident also in the genome because a lot of it is more recent uh, uh, gene flow or, or admixture in those families. Uh, those families are, are much more recently um, mixed. So anyway, who's black in America? The answer differs according to who you are, where you are. But legally, the U.S. has been defined socially by this one-drop rule or this rule of hypo-descent. Um, I'm not going to really get into that, uh, but you can look it up. And it's very important because what it does, did do, though, is that it created so much diversity in the African-American population, so much so that we can look at uh, uh, within most African-American families, there's a lot of diversity, even physically, skin color, eye color, hair color, texture. That's because of this one-drop rule, and we, as I said before, we accepted it um, after the 1850s, and we still sort of utilize it. I mean, if, 
if uh, an individual comes in a room and says, you know, I am African American, and then you know that they have one aunt, one parent who's white, let's say, they're still black because that's how we culturally define uh, the group. Now, why is this so important? Why is all of this sociology and history so important? Because we have to sort of try to understand and reconcile uh, what we know or don't know about our family history. And this is where the genetics comes in. So there are two types of analyses generally, okay? One is what we call admixture or, or for genetic ancestry. And we use these markers called ancestry informative markers, uh, which, which our group has helped um, uh, develop um, over, over the last 20 years. And, and, and what they do is you, if, you, if you look at a large number of them, you can actually um, uh, estimate continental ancestry. So the percentage West African, percentage European, percentage Native American ancestry. And, and show that individuals are a composite or a conglomerate of different continental groups. Everybody's mixed. Nobody's, you know, 100% pure anything, especially nowadays because, you know, I tell my students all the time, genes don't stay in your genes. <laughs> Anytime you put two groups of people together, there's going to be some mixing. I don't care. If they don't even speak the same language. That's just how it is. There is a language. Well, I won't get into that. But anyway, there is an important here that we need to understand that um, people, um, uh, uh, genes are shared across populations. And so we can leverage our understanding of the genetic variation to say something about ancestry. Now, what are some of these lineage-based um, uh, tests uh, that um, provide a, a, a larger um, or, or provide higher resolution in terms of insight? They're much more specific. However, they only represent a small portion of your genome. So what are these lineage-based ancestry markers? Mitochondrial DNA, which is maternally inherited, and um, Y-chromosome DNA, uh, as I mentioned, which is paternally inherited. So these are what we call clonally inherited markers that allow us to say something about your mother's 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 mother or your father's 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 father. That's it, okay? They don't say anything about any mixtures or anything like that, but they are really insightful for sort of this high resolution sort of ancestry in particular regions and ethnic groups. So this, this, this schematic here shows, just shows variation that we see. And as I said, nobody's uh, a pure. For instance, the, the black dots there represent uh, Nigerians. The red dots represent African-Americans. The blue dots represent uh, uh, whites from Chicago, the red are blacks from, from Chicago, the blue dots are, are whites from Chicago, and the green dots represent um, French, uh, Europeans. And so you'll notice that there is this, this, this spread of, of ancestry. This is, these, these dots represent ancestry across a continuum from what we see in Nigeria all the way to France, right? And we see that the African Americans and European Americans are somewhere in between a cluster around these particular um, uh, uh, groups, these continental groups. But for the most part, there is no clear dividing line in terms of who's who. In fact, if you look in that square, you'll see that there are some African Americans that have more European ancestry than some European. So what's important to understand here is that these markers don't define race, that's number one. Number two, they, uh, those individuals are defined by how they were socialized. So they self-reported their ancestry, meaning they said that they were black or they said that they were white. And that's important too, okay? Uh, because it captures something about how you define yourself and how your, how your environment uh, could be in terms of uh, diet and lifestyle. So anyway, these markers, as I mentioned before, are very important. We've, we've captured um, and understand a lot about these markers uh, and catalog them uh, and, and, and have utilized them to say something about the spread of ancestry. Now, one of the fascinating things is for African Americans and Hispanic populations, there is this wide, this huge spread of ancestry across uh, uh, the population. Some are more European than others, some are more African than others, and that's because of family history. And so, you know, folks have been plotting these, these, uh, these ancestries and these populations and, and then leveraging that information in their research. And I think that's, that's cool, it's very important, and it has taken what our understanding is about health and disease into a whole new dimension. 
this graph is, is funny. I did this when I was uh, this work when I was at Howard back in 2002, and and it's still evident today. What it represents here is it's a plot of ancestry, and along the x-axis at the bottom are individuals, and then the y-axis on the on the, going up and down on the left represents proportion of ancestry. And you'll notice that the individuals, the Vamiliki people from Cameroon, are pretty homogeneous there in red. And then you'll see European Americans from Baltimore, Maryland, in green. And then you'll notice the African Americans. Look at Look at that variation that's there. Some of them have a large proportion of European ancestry in green. Some of them have a large proportion of African ancestry in red. That is what we see when we look at African and Latino populations. Large, what we call variant in genetic ancestry. So there is no definitive uh, uh, profile for who's black or who's Hispanic. What it is is how you define yourself and then also your, your family history. And so we should leverage all of it. We should take all that information in as we study uh, uh, those communities. So on average, African Americans have about 20% European ancestry. That's what we see across the genome. Uh, this is just another way of showing that. This is a triangular plot. Native American ancestry at the top, European at the right, African at the, at, in the, on the left, and uh, West Africans on the left. And so you'll notice that the black dots are African Americans, the white dots are, are European. You'll notice the same situation where there is no dividing line. There's this mixture there, and there's this blurriness that says, you know, how do we define these people? Well, they define themselves, and that's important. How you were socialized, how you define yourself um, uh, is important. This, 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 uh, this next graph shows the ancestry of Hispanics, right? So these are Mexican Americans of Colorado. And look at the distribution. Instead of the African European, what we see is European, which is Spanish European, and Native American spread of ancestry. So that distribution is vastly different. There is some West African, as you see, some of them are going towards that axis, but not a lot. Most of them have this, they're on that line of 0% African, and they're more Native and, and Spanish European ancestry. Very, very fascinating. This is the uh, Mexican American of Colorado, right? Then we see another group of Hispanics, Puerto Ricans. We see the spread a different distribution, a lot less Native American and a lot more African ancestry. And that's because of the history of slavery on the island of Puerto Rico, the island of Cuba, Dominican Republic, and Haiti. We see those, and so this is where history um, uh, coincides with what we see with the genetics, because we expect to see higher African ancestry in those populations. Now, just because they have higher African ancestry doesn't mean that they're not Hispanic or, 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 or Latino or however you want to call them. What it means is that their family history is vastly different than other groups, let's say Mexican Americans. So this, this map is, is really fascinating. So over the last, you know, 30 some odd years, we've been going around the country looking at different African American communities, estimating ancestry. What's really cool is that when you look at um, urban north, let's say, versus the rural south, we see a higher proportion of European ancestry in these African American communities than in the south. But out west, it's even higher. In fact, in Seattle, Washington, it's almost 40%, which means that Three to every three or four out of every ten African Americans that we tested had a white parent. That's what that means. And so that 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 also goes back to what I was saying about this relaxation of these social constraints. Those individuals define themselves differently than individuals in the rural South. And so if you look in uh, South Carolina along the coast, the Gullahsee Islands, 3.5 percent, Charleston 9.8, which is about 10 percent, and then. Um, uh, Columbia, South Carolina, about 18%. Very interesting um, uh, histories in, in, in the low country of South Carolina, and we see that reflective in the gene pool. So the lowest level of European ancestry we see in African Americans are in the Gullah Sea Islands, there 3.5%, and the highest is on the West Coast, 35% in Seattle. So I'm not going to get uh, that deep into all of this, but just know that just, I, I really want you to understand that there is uh, geographic differences across the United States in terms of ancestry, and a lot of that has to do with those local histories, those European countries that controlled those regions during that time, and then the movements um, uh, subsequent uh, with, the, with the Great Migration. 
Uh, as I mentioned, you know, there is this history in Cuba and Puerto Rico of uh, enslaved Africans. Um, and we see among Caribbean populations even a difference in proportion of ancestry. And a lot of that has to do with how isolated those islands were, the histories of who controlled those islands, and then also tourism. For instance, in St. Thomas, we see that St. Thomas, we see there's a lot more European ancestry than we see in Jamaica Barbados. The different um, uh, um, history of tourism on those islands than it is in those uh, other um, um, uh, than those other islands, and so we see that reflective in the gene pool for those individuals. Now, this is where the cool science comes in, right? So there are companies that have emerged that utilize this genomic technology to help individuals say something about themselves and their family history. So there's a company called 23andMe that, that actually I think is pretty cool because what they do is they um, uh, type markers across, the, uh, across all the chromosomes, and then they do this chromosome painting with, which, which shows the blocks of ancestry across these chromosomes. Now, a lot of companies do that, but I, I, I wanted to show you the 23andMe uh, because it's, it's nice and colorful. So the, the, this schematic represents my genome this is my, D, my DNA. This is my um, ancestry here. So you'll notice that I have about 12% European ancestry, about 8% Native American, and about 80% West African. If you look across these chromosomes, some of them are like what I call a composite. Some of them have huge chunks of European, like for instance, chromosome 10, half of which is European, my chromosome 10. And then, and then so, so, so we have these blocks of European and big, big blocks of African and small blocks of, of Native American. And we can map this out. But remember, there are genes on these chromosomes, and these genes define traits. Some are, are simple traits, others are complex traits, right? And so understanding the ancestry of those genes may help us understand health in certain communities. Now, if you look at chromosome 15, you'll notice that it's all African. It's all West African. I have African alleles across that entire chromosome. Now, the three biggest predictors of skin color are on chromosome 15. This is why I have this rich chocolate uh, skin tone that I have is because I have those African alleles for those skin color genes on chromosome 15. Now that's just skin color. Imagine if we were able to map genes, let's say for prostate cancer and breast cancer and other diseases, you leveraging this ancestry um, uh, mapping approach. And in fact, we, we've been doing that and we've been finding that there are certain genes that are more um, enriched in certain populations that might increase or decrease risk for disease. And I'm, I'm not gonna get into that, but it's, it's cool stuff. And if you're a student, um, I, would, I, would, I would push you towards uh, genomics and bioinformatics because uh, over the next 10 years, I think it's just gonna be, gonna be fascinating, just cool, cool stuff happening. Now, we look at genetic ancestry and we, look at these sex link markers like mitochondria DNA and the Y chromosome, we actually can um, uh, explore across human populations these lineages and how they've changed. So remember, um, genes change by mutation. So through time, you have a mutation. So populations move, there's a mutation there, it's a change, a polymorphism, and that's recorded and it's passed on. When we look at different populations, for instance, for mitochondrial DNA, this is maternally linked DNA here in this schematic, we find that these letters represent what we call haplo groups. These are large families of related lineages, okay? So these are groups of related lineages that are defined by these letters, right? And you'll notice that for um, Africa, there's only like two letters. There's L and there's M. But there are subsets of L, subsets of M. There are subsets of all of these letters. But these haplogroups are important because they represent groups of related lineages. That's, they have a shared common ancestor, right? And what I find interesting but also sad is that in Europe, we have over 10 letters there, over 10 haplogroups. But there's not a lot of variation there. But the reason why that they, there are 10 is because for the most part, scientists study themselves, and so most of the scientists are European, of European ancestry, and so they, they really defined and captured what little variation that was there. There wasn't a lot of work in Africa, which is why there's only two letters there. I think it's sad because if we were to 
look at the genetic variation in Africa, they would have to be a lot more of those macro, uh, those haplogroups, those, those large families of related lineages, but it's restricted because of the history of science, okay? I just wanted to throw that in. Uh, you'll notice that uh, in the New World is ABCD. Those are a subset of what we see in Asia. Those are Asian haplogroups. There's only four. And for the most part, there's, you know, X2, but there's a debate on where, where X is uh, coming from. But, but ABCD are from, Ant are from Asia. And, and, and it's important because at one point, there was a lot of variation in the New World. But once the Europeans came, they wiped out a lot of these individuals. And so right now, what we can capture is those four groups. It's sad because there had to have been a lot more genetic variation there, but due to the reduction in population size, we, we've lost a lot of that. Now, when we talk about African ancestry in the science, we use these, um, uh, these lineage markers, Y chromosome and mitochondrial DNA. And we also, at one point, we're doing some autosomal markers uh, for admixture, but we're not offering that right now. But one of the things that is, uh, that's interesting is when we look at, let's say, for instance, mitochondrial DNA, it's a, it's a straightforward approach. And this is a really simplistic way of showing it. The mother passes it on to their daughter uh, and also to the son. So, the, so mitochondrial DNA is passed on to the children, but only females pass it on. So the male, uh, while he has his mother's mitochondrial DNA, he doesn't pass it on. Uh, it's only passed on through females. So within the family, they should all have the same mitochondrial DNA, and it should be different from the neighbor, let's say, right? So we can look at the profile, the polymorphism along that stretch of mitochondrial DNA, along those nucleotides, and we can say, okay, these group together because they share the same um, profile of polymorphisms, right? And we can compare those lineages, those sequences, in a database of a large group of sequences from uh, all over the world and say, oh, well, this one matches with the Fulani in Nigeria, which is different from the Akan or the Mandinka from Senegal, right? And then utilize um, uh, the anthropology, the history, archaeology in those regions to really understand the movement and the cultures of those people and, and better define sort of where these matches may have come from. For instance, the Fulani are, are, are nomadic, meaning they move around. And so while the Fulani in Nigeria may have a, a particular profile, it's, it's vastly different in some cases from the profile uh, in, of Fulani in other uh, uh, countries or regions. What's also important to understand is that these continental, these, these, these um, state boundaries, these government or country boundaries are not, um, uh, they're, they're, they don't define sort of the boundaries of these groups. These groups emerged before the, these countries were, were um, uh, parsed out and divided and these boundaries emerged. And so, you know, when we look, at, for instance, in, in, in Western Nigeria and Eastern, I'm sorry, Eastern Nigeria and Western Cameroon, we see a, a continuum of variation, even though there's a boundary there that defines nationality, th those groups before that boundary was there went back and forth across that region, and so they share a common answer. So the Y chromosome, as I mentioned, this is a, we had to blow it up, uh, really um, uh, magnified about 10,000 times to show how big it is, or actually how small it is compared to the X chromosome. So here's the X on the left and the Y on the right, and that little glob, that little glob of DNA is what created all the havoc in the world, <laughs> but it, it, it's important genes on there that, that, uh, that we can uh, uh, leverage. And so we can look at the history of Y chromosomes across the world, and also, just like mitochondrial DNA, there are these haplogroups, these groups of related lineages of Y chromosomes, and we can trace them to particular continental uh, uh, groups or, or regions. Uh, and it's fascinating because, um, uh, as just like with mitochondrial DNA, the root is in Africa, and from that emerged all these other uh, populations. Now, this is just a schematic showing some um, ancestry testing that we've done. We've been involved in a lot of the um, uh, the PBS uh, work of, of uh, Henry Louis Gates and um, and others looking at ancestry of particular um, African Americans. Now, for instance, this schematic just shows my ancestry in northern Nigeria, sort of where my mitochondrial DNA is common at, 
Um, and uh, you'll notice that it's northern Nigeria among the Hausa people. Um, we also did a, a, a testing with, um, with the African American Live Series 1, the first one and the second one. During the first one, I think it was Mae Jamison, Dr. Mae Jamison, was tested. She had one of the oldest uh, mitochondrial DNA sequences that we had at, that we had found at that time was L1, which is one of the ancestral um, uh, early lineages, and it goes back almost um, uh, 60,000 years ago, 70,000 years ago. And it's you, well, one of the things we find is that the the, the oldest, the older the lineage, the, the the more common it is across a bigger geographic area. Because, you know, if it's been around longer, it's going to spread. And so there really is no, there was no way for us to really say where, which group it, this emerged from or where. And so um, uh, uh, we, we, we were able to really define um, just a region, not a specific area. Oprah was completely different, um, uh, L3B, one of the uh, more recent lineages, and we were able to really match that with the folks in Liberia. Uh, Quincy Jones L1C, Chris Tucker L1C. So we can actually look at across these um, areas where um, these uh, uh, individuals' ancestry may have come from. So I want to end with this. Folks say, why study maternal and paternal lineages? Well, if you go back one generation, you have two ancestors. You go back two generations, you go back um, uh, the four ancestors. If we go back nine generations, there were 512 people who contributed to our genome. If you go back during the period of slavery 350 years ago, that's 14 generations, 16,384 ancestors. There's no way we can tell you everything about all of that. But we can, with some power, say something about your, your father's Y chromosome and your mother's mitochondrial DNA. And so I think that's, that's an interesting thing to, uh, to understand. So I'm going to end there because we have to take some questions. And uh, I guess they will... Uh, send them um, via chat. Perfect. Thank you, so Dr. Kudels. We do have a few questions. So our first question comes from Ellen, and she would like to know, are AIMS similar to chromosome painting? So uh, AIMS are used to create the chromosome painting. So these ancestry informative markers, that's what we call AIMS, um, allow us to say something about uh, the ancestry of that particular variation, whether it's of Native American or European or African ancestry. And so if you, t if you look at a large number of them across a chromosome, you can then create that chromosome painting. Excellent. Our next question comes from Deb, and Deb said that she did a DNA uh, sampling with several different companies and got different results for each. Why would that be? Well, you, you have to understand, each, while, while the, the actual testing is routine and people, for the most part, the, the, um, the companies use the same markers for the most part um, and the same sort of methodology, what's different is databases. Each company has a different set of data. And so that is, that is the, the, the number one reason, reason why um, you see the differences across companies. It's not that the technology is vastly different. I mean, we all use the same technology. Our databases, which are proprietary, differ. And so I think that's an important question. I think customers really need to understand that. When you, when you go to these companies, you really have to ask questions about their database and understand that some databases are limited in terms of answering particular questions. Like, for instance, if you really want to understand African ancestry, some of the companies have very small databases of African populations. Excellent. I think we have time for one more question, and this question comes from Jonathan. Jonathan says, can you speak more about health disparities among black and Latino populations and how sun exposure, vitamin D levels exacerbate this? How much does uh, melanin concentration play into the picture? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Uh, you know, there, there is a lot of research now looking at vitamin D and the effects of vitamin D deficiency on, on uh, overall health, and uh, in particular, cardiovascular, diabetes, and cancer. Um, and vitamin D is one in which uh, it's made in the skin upon sun exposure, but also if you have darker skin, you make less vitamin D. And so there, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. There is no clear consensus on this, but it appears that vitamin D, vitamin D deficiency could increase your risk 
for those particular disparities. And that's important for uh, uh, populations of color like Hispanics and African Americans because uh, many of them, many of those individuals are vitamin D deficient. Excellent, thank you so much for that. Uh, unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. Additional questions can be emailed to ratalum at rat.edu or tweeted to at rat underscore alumni with the hashtag MeRATWebinar, and we will direct your questions to the panel. Note that all participants will receive an email from us in the next few days with a link to today's webinar recording. Dr. Kittles, thank you again for being our presenter today, and thank you to all of our listeners for participating in today's webinar. Please consider joining us on January 31st for Follow the Leader, an evolution in leadership spaces with Lori Ann Schnuck, Strategic Account Manager for Steelcase Incorporated. <laughs> Your private office is not only a refuge and a place for focus and individual work, it's also a place where leaders need to make their thinking viable as they interact with colleagues in schedules and spontaneous encounters. But business leaders work differently today, and so should their workplaces. In this webinar, you will learn an understanding of chronology of leadership spaces, how various leadership spaces impact culture within an organization, and what Steelcase is doing most recently with leadership spaces. Thank you again for joining us. Please exit this webinar by simply closing your WebEx window, and please do let us know what you thought of the webinar by taking the very brief survey, which will pop up when you exit. Have a great day.